our next presenter is Rabbi Ed Feinstein. Um, I heard Rabbi Feinstein 22 years ago give a talk that I think about every year when we start reading Bambi Bar. He talked about what wilderness really meant. And it was a seminal moment. I, I, as I read on Saturday, uh, the Torah portion, I kept thinking back to that, to that presentation. So you, Rabbi Feinstein, you've, you've influenced me and a lot of other people in, in the way you've taught and the way you continue to teach. And we're greatly appreciative of that. Rabbi Ed Feinstein is the rabbi at Valley Beth Shalom. He's also a, a teacher at the Ziegler School. Uh, and without further ado, Rabbi Ed Feinstein. Well, thank you so much. So to everyone who's on the uh, East Coast and Midwest, Hag Sameach, and to everyone who's out here, it's uh, just about beginning. The evening is just about beginning. So we're close to beginning of the Yontif. I wish all of you a very, very sweet and Hag Sameach, a very happy holiday. Of course, it's very difficult. We had really hoped to all be together this Yontif, and to be stuck on Zoom still is kind of frustrating. So for those of you who can be together, what a great gift. And as well, with our thoughts and prayers for friends and family in Israel right now who are hunkering down in shelters and hiding in stairwells and cowering under beds where they're terrified of rockets falling from the sky, we, our prayers are certainly with them as well. Now let's begin learning together. Breshit bara Elohim et shamayim ve'et ha'aretz. In the beginning, God created heaven and the earth. We all know that's the first line of the Torah. God begins the Torah with the creation of the world. And this is terribly important because the function of religion and the function of religious culture is also to create a world for us, to give us a world that is understandable, a world whose patterns we can predict. Sometimes we can even control them, a world that we can wrestle meaning out of. That's what religious culture is meant to do. It's meant to give us a world we can wrestle meaning out of a world that we can walk and know that things are going to happen according to a certain order. In Genesis, God creates a natural order. So gravity works all the time, not just 99% of the time. That would be a scary world to live in if you think about it. But gravity works all the time. The patterns of nature are ubiquitous and consistent. And then the Torah presents what I think is one of the most chutzpahdik ideas in all of human consciousness, that not only is there a natural order to the world, there's a moral order to the world. And that moral order basically dictates that virtue brings reward and sin brings punishment. It's what the whole book of Deuteronomy pounds on us again and again and again to believe. And that idea that the world has a moral order that we can count on, that we can have faith in, and that that moral order explains the phenomena that we see around us, that's one of the cardinal ideas of traditional faith. The problem, however, of course, is what happens when the world doesn't behave that way? What, happened the world, what happens when the world brings us suffering that's unmerited? What happens when the world brings chaos? What happens when the world seems to be absurd and random? It's what the philosophers call the problem of evil. That is, bad things happening to good people, things that shouldn't, often, shouldn't ought to be happening. You all remember the story of the sage Elisha ben Abuya, the principal student of Rebbe Meir, who witnessed a child falling from a ladder and saw him die in front of him and proclaimed to the world, late din va late dayan. There is no judge and there is no justice. What happens when the world presents us with one of those moments of just catastrophe and this year, unfortunately, we've seen that again and again and again. I certainly have seen it in my community. I mean, not only have we had an awful lot of deaths from COVID, which are just tragic, but even the sort of normal circumstances of people who die of things that are normal, they had to die alone in hospitals with no one but a, with no one but a nurse who was ultimately a stranger holding their hand and a nurse covered in three layers of protective covering. We've had so many suicides of people who are despondent at the loss of income, at the loss of businesses, at the loss of, of connection with other people. Catastrophe after catastrophe. And we raise our eyes toward heaven and we ask the natural question, why me, God? Why us? Why? Now, turns out that there's a book of the Bible which deals with this very question. What happens when our experience violates the moral order that Deuteronomy promised us, that the Torah promised us. 
There's a book of the Bible which takes this on courageously and creatively. Unfortunately, it's a book that Jews don't often read. It's in the third section of the Hebrew Bible called Ketuvim. So right away, it's sort of tucked away toward the end. You know, like they try to repress it but couldn't get rid of it, so they stuck it at the end where no one might notice it. But it's there, and it's a remarkable book. It's just a remarkable book. It's called the book of Job, Eov in Hebrew. Now let's back up for just a second. In the book of Deuteronomy, we are told that if you have a religious problem, there are three places to go. That's my dog. You go to the priest, you go to the prophet, you go to the elder. The priest is the one who holds the community's collective wisdom, the community's collective revealed tradition. We call that Torah. The prophet holds his own tradition of revelation. We call that Navi. Those are the first two sections of the Hebrew Bible. The elder. On what basis does the elder offer us religious wisdom? Well, that's what he does. It's the wisdom tradition, chokhmah. It's not derived from revelation. So it's not specifically Jewish. It is, in fact, derived from experience, from life experience. And so it has great parallels with other wisdom traditions from the ancient Near East. And the third section of the Hebrew Bible is the repository of wisdom. Now, there are roughly two kinds of wisdom, roughly. There is conventional wisdom, which reinforces the traditions of Torah and prophets. You'll find that in the book of Proverbs, where the idea that virtue is rewarded and sin is punished is repeated in a hundred different ways again and again. And then, and then there is a subversive tradition, a sort of religious counterculture, which was included in our Bible, even though it directly questions and challenges and even contradicts the traditions of Torah and prophets. And that's what you'll find in the book of Job. That's what you'll find in the book of Ecclesiastes. I, I would also suggest that's what you find in the book of Esther. These are traditions which I don't know how they got into the Bible. Somebody let them in. Well, I know how they got into the Bible. Because as Nahum Sarna, the great teacher from Brandeis University, taught us in the very first line of his wonderful book, Understanding Genesis, the Bible is not an ideological monolith. The Bible isn't a catechism. The Bible isn't a book which tells you what you have to believe and when you have to recite it. The Bible is, in fact, a book which wants to reflect on the full repertoire of human experiences and human reflection. And in that sense, skepticism, doubt, questioning and challenging has a role to play within the Bible itself. And I think that's remarkable because that means that the Jewish community always was a community of sufficient solidarity to embrace questions to embrace argument and debate, to embrace a pluralism of points of view, to embrace people who said, I don't accept the cardinal principles, but I count myself part of this community. That is, the community had sufficient sources of solidarity as a community, as a family, as a community of caring, to tolerate loudmouth teenagers who say, yeah, but what about, and to tolerate the skeptic and the and the outsider and the one who would challenge, even the heretic, even the heretic. And that's what we find in these books. So what is the book of Job? It is a book which takes on the most difficult question of all religion. How do I deal with evil? How do I deal with that which is outside the moral order that the rest of the Bible presents to me? How do I deal with that? What do I do with that? How do I understand it? And how do I respond to it? And when you open the book of Job, what you're going to discover is the book of Job itself is not a book. It's an anthology. There are at least three different sections or three different voices in the book of Job. And they come in different forms of literature. And the first two chapters are a prose tale, a fairy tale. Once upon a time in the merry old land of Uz, there lived a righteous man whose name was Job. And then it tells us a story. That takes the first two chapters. Chapter three is a transitional chapter in which Job screams out his anguish. And from chapters four all the way to chapter 28, we have a dialogue written in biblical poetry between Job and his friends. Now, friends like these, you really don't want to have. 
because here the whole topic is taken up in dialogue. And it's very unclear whether the writer of that section or the writers of that section knew about the first section or whether they were just juxtaposed by an editor, by a redactor. And then a third section, which comes toward the end of the book, gives us two testimonies, two soliloquies, one by Job and one by God. And each of these sections, each of these sections gives us a whole different way of answering the question, why me, God? Why is this happening to me? How do I bear this suffering? So let's go quickly through all of them. We only have a few moments together, but someday we'll have a lot more time to read this book carefully. The first section is a fairy tale, once upon a time. And it's written in a very simple prose with very simple images and very simple words. And it tells us about a man who suffers terribly. And that man portrays an ethic of radical acceptance. First, he loses his children. He loses his wealth. He loses everything that is precious to a human being. And when, when he considers this, his words are, and if you happen to have a Hebrew Bible, look up Job chapter 1 and look at the end of the chapter 1, verse, verse 20. Job arose, tore his robe, cut off his hair, threw himself on the ground, and he worshipped. He worshipped God, even at that moment, having lost all 10 of his children, having lost all of his wealth in the world. Even then, he says to God, naked came I out of my mother's womb, naked shall I return. The Lord has given Adonai Natan, Adonai Lakach, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of God. And he did not sin and he did not catch, cast reproach on, Job, uh, on God. The Job of chapter 1 and 2 is a Job of radical acceptance. In chapter 2, he loses his health. He's in a terrible shape. And then his wife comes to him and says, curse God and die, and she's part of the curse. And Job says, you talk as a shameless woman. Shall we accept only the good from God and not accept the evil? And for all that, he didn't do anything sinful. The Job of chapter 1 and 2 is a Job of radical acceptance. Whatever comes my way, I will accept. But the irony of Job chapter 1 and 2 is that we know something that Job doesn't know. We know why he's suffering. There's a story here. You see, the story of chapter 1 and 2 takes place on two levels. We just read the section of the earth where Job is suffering and accepts his suffering. But the story also tells us what happens in heaven. And it gives us sort of the, the backstory, the, the surrounding story, the context. What happened? God is felling. God is bragging about his wonderful friend Job, who is so righteous. And Satan, not Satan, the church lady, Satan, but Satan, who is the sort of alter ego of God, prosecuting angel of God, says, of course he's good. You rewarded him. Take away the reward, and you'll see he'll sin like all the other guys on earth. Now, that's a grotesque thought. I mean, what, what, what the Satan is pointing to is a paradox of religious virtue. If virtue is rewarded, is there a question about whether the person is virtuous because they're virtuous or they're virtuous to earn the reward? Are you really in love with God or are you doing this to get the interest on your bank accounts? And the Satan says, you take away that stuff, you'll see. Now, the right answer is no. But God says, go ahead. And we, the reader, we are in some ways voyeuristically watching a grotesque, human experiment. A man suffers so horribly so that God can test him, so that, so that God can win a bet against Satan. What happens in that first fairy tale is that the radical acceptance that Job demonstrates, that full, perfect faith in God that Job demonstrates, it's, it's almost mocked because the God he believes in, we know, it's not a God who, who is trustworthy. It's not a God who is just. It's not a God who is kind. It's not a God who is compassionate, but rather a God who plays games with people's lives and their fate. Einstein once said, God does not play dice with the universe. The writer of the book of Job says not so. At least he plays poker with him. At least he's playing poker. And, and, and how, what kind of God is it? And so the, the, you leave that, those first two chapters with this unsettled feeling. How can, he be, how can he be demonstrating radical acceptance to a God who, 
isn't worthy of such acceptance, and worthy of such reverence. And that's how the first two chapters end. That's radical. But then we changed, we turned the page. In chapter three, Job says, I want to die. And the three friends who have come to sit with him, and in the first chapters, they're sitting quietly, which is what you're supposed to do at a shiva. In the second section, in the poetic section of the book of Job, from chapter four on, there's a dialogue. The friends will say to him, you know how God works in the world. God does not punish the innocent. If you are suffering, it's because you did something. You sinned. And it's very explicit. Let me just read a section. In chapter 4, Eliphaz, who's his neighbor, says to him, is, says, to, think now, what innocent man ever perished? Where have the upright ever been destroyed? As I see it, those who plow evil and sow mischief reap them. They perish from a blast from God, are gone from the breath of his nostril. If you are suffering, Job, you must have done something wrong. You must have done something wrong. You must have sinned. And Job keeps saying, no, I did not sin. The friends of Job come and they present to him our Deuteronomic theology. You are suffering because you sinned. And if you were to repent, you would be justified. You would be, you would be cured of this suffering. So all you got to do, Job, is repent your sin, confess your sin. And if you don't know the sin, confess it anyway. Because God accepts confession. Because God accepts repentance. Stand in a confessional way. Stand in a penitent way in front of God. And God will forgive you. And you'll be restored to the life that you had before. And Job says, no. I refuse. This is not fair. This is God hurting people for no reason. He accuses God of cruelty. This is a God who is killing me. Because if I did sin, what sin was it? And what sin could have brought such a punishment? And why not tell me the sin? What the good does it do? How does it rehabilitate me if I don't even know the sin that I did? And he pushes back on the friends. And he says to God, and he says to the friends, let's have a trial. It's a good Jewish book. Let's go, let's go to court. Let's go to court. Because in a court, we're equal. In a court, God's power doesn't matter. In a court, it's only a question of justice. Let's go to court. Let's adjudicate this. But of course, God won't go to court with him. God won't go to court with him. And this is the problem. You see, what Job in the second section is pointing out is that we have two ideas of God and they contradict each other. We want to believe that God is just and God rewards virtue and punishes evil, moral evil. But we also believe that God is other. And if God is other, how can you ever say that God is really just? And what kind of justice is it when this happens? And what we see in the second section is a confrontation between the friend's ideology, their worldview, the way they have constructed their world, and Job's experience, the facts of Job's experience. And they're clinging to their worldview. They cling to their worldview with such tenacity that they refuse to accept the fact of Job's experience. At the end, they get downright nasty. And there are three, sex, three rounds of debate, and the third one is truncated. But as you get to the third round of debate, of dialogue, of dialogue, they accuse him of being evil. They outright accuse him of, of torturing the weak and taking advantage of the vulnerable and stealing from those who are poor already. They accuse him of these things with no evidence because when a person holds an ideology, when a person holds a view of the world that gives them a sense of who they are and what they are and how their world works, no facts in the world can shake them of that ideology. No facts can shake them of the paradigm of their sense of the world. They will rather twist the facts, create what we call now in the news, you know, alternative facts, than let go of their ideology. And even if it means torturing this man, even if it means rubbing it in, telling him again and again, the reason you suffer is because you deserved it, which effectively doubles, their, doubles his suffering. But that's what happens in that second section. That's what happens in the second section. Job, however, doesn't relent. He doesn't relent. And so there is something remarkable in that section. Job's protest 
He refuses to accept the justice of his suffering. He refuses to accept that. Even if it means giving up his belief in a just God, he will not, he will not take upon himself an accusation of disloyalty to God and immorality. He refuses to accept it. The ethic of protest, of pushing back against that, that's Job's second response. That's the response of the second Job, the Job of dialogue. A Job who refuses to accept it, who refuses to accept it, and stands in righteous protest against a God, a world, a condition, which challenges and destroys him physically and financially and familially in every other way. Better to die as a martyr to his own sense of justice than to say, I accept a, a justice that's not justice. The third one are two testimonies, Job's testimony and God's testimony. Two soliloquies. First, Job talks. And Job describes himself, and this is a different Job than the Job in the, in the prose section or the Job of the dialogue. It's a much calmer Job than the Job of the dialogue. In fact, the Job of this soliloquy, this third section, sounds a lot like the friends. He says, look, I was righteous. I have lived a righteous life. I have lived within the community. He was a village elder. And he talks about how he cared for the widow and protected the orphan and gave to the poor and was eyes to the blind and was legs to the lame. And he did all the things he was supposed to do to protect the vulnerable in his community. And his claim to God is, why don't you do that for me? Now that I need that kind of help, where are you for me as I live out the ethic that you told me? Job is a good man. And he protests his goodness to God. But he does it with a sense of, not a sense of accusation, as this, the dialogue Job does. But in this third section, a different, a different one. A, God, a, a Job who says, in the context of my village, in my social context, I did everything I could to make the world gentle. And then God shows up. At the end of the book, God shows up. It's a remarkable thing, you know. But here's the irony. Usually when God shows up and God makes a speech, it's the end of the book. It's the end of the story, but not here. God is going to talk, but it's going to leave us even more unsettled than before. The God who shows up at the end says to him, who do you think you are? Where were you? And takes him on a grand tour of the wonders of nature. But the wonders of nature that God takes Job on a tour of at the end of the book of Job, from chapter 38 to chapter 42, are all the wild places. This is Maurice Sendak, where the wild things are. It takes them to the, to the vaults of the snow and to the constellations, and then takes them to the wild animals of the world, the ostriches and the wild sheep and the wild asses. And then the, 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 the epitome of it, he takes them to the two great mythical beasts that scare the hell out of everyone. Behemoth, behemoth. This huge monster of a land creature that can't be that can't be that can't be tamed, and Leviathan, the great sea monster. And as God's describing these monsters to Job, you get the sense that God's quelling. He enjoys this wildness. What is God saying to Job at the end of the story? He's saying, Yeah, in your village. You created a social order which was gentle and kind, but I, God, I live in the wild place. I live in the wild, random chaos of the universe. And that's what I am. And so you can't come to me and ask me for justice because in the world that I live in, you have no place and you have no voice. And at the end, what happens is something quite remarkable, something tragic. So what we have here are three different Jobs. Job of the prose tale, Job of the dialogue, Job of the testimonies, the soliloquies at the end. And in each one, I want to suggest that we have a heroic Job who faces a tragic situation. The Job of the first is heroically accepting. Radical acceptance is a heroic stance under certain circumstances. All of us rabbis have been with families that had to put a loved one on hospice care or had to turn off the machinery of life support. It takes great courage to do that, to say, this is the right thing. This is better than 
endless suffering. And yet, the book of Job says radical acceptance may be heroic, but it's tragic in the end. Because the God you are revering is not a God who really cares in the end. And that's tragic. But yet, radical acceptance is a pushback. It's an act of love in the face of tragic cruelty. And the Job of the dialogue is the heroism of protest. The protest, the, the prophetic or, or, or pro, the chutzpahdik protest that says, I demand justice and I will not accept a judgment which compromises my own integrity that I know I have. I won't hide myself from my own experience. I won't accept an ideology that tells me I'm evil if I know that I'm not. I demand justice in the world. I will not live with any rationalization of injustice. Any rationalization of injustice violates my conscience, and I'd rather die as a righteous person than live with a rationalization of injustice. It's tragic. It's tragic because when Job calls God to account, when Job subpoenas him and summons him to court, God doesn't come. God doesn't answer the protest. And alas, the protest doesn't change the world. The world don't work that way. But yet, the heroism of the protest puts us in a place, puts us in a place where we can at least push back against the cruelty of the world. And the third section, the soliloquies, well, in that section, Job says, yes, God, I know. You live in a world of chaos and randomness and absurdity, but I've created a bubble. And maybe outside the bubble of my village, the bubble of my social context, the world is random and horrifying. And maybe that random absurdity intervenes into our world and steals life and steals well-being. But I will do everything in my power to protect the ones I love, to protect the ones I share life with, to protect the ones I, I share this planet with. I will create that, that bubble. And maybe day by day, I can strengthen it and push away some of that chaos. It's, it's the activist response. So in the end, let me ask two quick questions. We only have a moment left. Who let this book into the Bible? A book which so questions the other tenets of biblical faith. And the answer is, yeah, they did. They did, because we're a tradition of powerful questions as well as remarkable answers. And that shows the solidity and the solidarity of the Jewish people and our intellectual power and honesty. And why a triptych? Why three versions instead of just one? Why not a simple statement of ideology? Why do you suffer? Here's the answer, short book. The answer is because in the end, the book of Job says religion can't solve the problem of evil. Religion can't remove the tragic from human life, but it can give us tools. It can show us a way to play a role, whether it's the role of radical acceptance as Job 1, the role of protest as Job 2, or the role of world builder as Job 3. It can give us a, a way to respond to the evil which can still give us a pathway to find meaning in a difficult and chaotic and tragic world. And for that, I think this is a powerfully, powerfully remarkable book and a book which is worthy of our attention, particularly in a year after a global pandemic and all the ac accompanying catastrophes that we've experienced this year. I recommend this book to you. It's a very hard book to read. There are some wonderful translations. The JPS translation is not bad. It's very good, actually. A new translation by Dr. Edward Greenstein, Eddie Greenstein, from formerly of JTS, now of Bar Ilan. It just came out and won the National Jewish Book Awards. Excellent. A wonderful translation and commentary by uh, Professor Shendlin of JTS is a wonderful uh, resource. A new translation by Professor Alter of Berkeley is a new translation and quite worthwhile. All of these are worthwhile. Open this book and meditate. And ask yourself, and perhaps in, ask your chavurah, ask those around you and the friends you share life with, how do we respond when bad things happen to good people? How do we find meaning? How do we find strength? How we, do we find resolution? When the world so disappoints us, and we ask the question, God, why me? What answer do we give the one who asks that question? Thanks for listening. Hak Sameach, I hope it's a sweet holiday for us all.
thank you, Tom, for moderating today. Rabbi Blumenthal, welcome. Good to see you. <laughs> Rabbi Feinstein, thank you very much. Really insightful words uh, and, and a, a really an interesting look at the book of Job. Again, I, I think in the year that we've come through, this is really a meaningful time to think about this book in, in the Bible. I really, we, I really personally appreciated your teaching today. So, so appreciate that. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. With that, I'll turn this over to Rabbi Jacob Blumenthal, and uh, we'll continue on for another what, 20 more hours to go, whatever, how many more hours you got to go. So Rabbi Blumenthal, it's, it's yours.